Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Live Your Spa Life Show. Spa life is a lifestyle that accepts that accomplishment and harmony coexist. The spa and spa life, the SPA, is for seek power always, that power within you to do your deeper work in the world. I am so thrilled to introduce our special guest today, Jeanette Anderson, who her title is the expansionist because she helps leaders and their businesses grow. For four decades, you heard me, four decades, she's been a passionate advocate and entrepreneur as the best path to personal expression, growth, and contribution. Jeanette, welcome to the show. Hi, Diane. Pleasure to be here. How are you? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for, for being here. You have so much to expand and share in what you're doing. And I just want to jump right in where you have a different take on BS in terms of belief system. <laughs> Talk to us yeah. a little bit about that, about how people actually suck at self-promotion. Well, there's actually two things there. So the BS, I like to take BS out of busy because busy, busy, busy is what a lot of people do. And a lot of us get our value or try to get our value from being busy. Have you ever been at a an event or with other entrepreneurs or speaking to friends who are business people and and had this conversation where it's like oh yesterday I worked 14 hours oh you think you work hard well I do this and that and this and that and I work there's this competition as to who can be the busiest and and not only is it not very functional um, to be that busy but it's also kind of ridiculous for us to try and outdo each other and out martyr each other so what I often do, because I've got a real background in um, about 30 years in personal development facilitation and coaching and training coaches to be coaches, is really look at the belief systems because our beliefs, uh, our issues, our stuff becomes our businesses issues and stuff. And so when we take the BS, the belief systems of my value comes from working hard, my value comes from doing the hard stuff. I don't know about you, but I've had that belief my whole life. So of course, what does that lead to? I got to make everything hard in order to be valuable. So that sucks. That yeah. sucks. That sucks <laughs> because that's why there's so many women getting burnt out, um, exhausted, overwhelmed, and and eventually end up not being able to do their business, share the gifts, etc. So I really encourage entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, to um, take a look at where do we, what are our beliefs around. Do we have to work really hard? Um, is it a struggle? Is it more valuable or righteous or, um, you know, important to actually strain and struggle and pay big prices? Those are just beliefs. They got installed when we were young and they create that whole, I got to be busy, busy, busy. Instead of, I need to be effective. And effective is often not busy. Effective right. is doing the things that matter. Right. And, and I love that you bring this up. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Bill Gates' quote about busy's the new stupid. Yeah, I haven't heard that one, but that's a good one. I like that one. <laughs> I, figured, I like it a lot. <laughs> right? Because, you know, you look at what does busy even mean, right? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really, it's not attached to anything tangible. It's like, you know, I'm busy, you know, it's like, what does that even look like? So yeah. I love that you're, you're speaking into this and, you know, we all have 24 hours in the day and I know that you have some ways that you have impact so that you go beyond the busy, that you're actually really clear about what you're doing. Talk a little bit about like the clear whys and support network sure the well and so why kind of touches on that other question that you have of why do we suck at self-promotion and a lot of the reason we suck at self-promotion is because we're making it all about us I don't want to be a bother I don't want to you know be pushy I, 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 I. it's all about us instead of about the other person yeah. and so when we get into why we do what we do that will often take us into the realm of the other person so our whys get us out of our ego quite often now there are some people's whys that are all about ego and and so forth and ego is not a bad thing it often gets a bad rap but it can put us into uh, fear instead of love and so the whys why we do what we do why I need what you have and why do it, why should I buy it from you are three of the most important questions that entrepreneurs need to answer. And so the first one, why do we do what we do is really 
important if you if you haven't watched Simon Sinek's video on it's actually on leadership but it's actually the 17 best minutes on marketing I've seen um, his video video on why or his, his book start with why I highly highly recommend it for all entrepreneurs because it talks about the fact that people don't buy what we do they buy why we do what we do because there's so many people who do what we do we'd like to think we're unique but really frankly there's a billion people who well maybe not a billion I might be exaggerating slightly <laughs> There's a lot of people who do what we do. The question is, do you, what's your flavor? What's your unique secret sauce? What do you bring to the table that others don't? And that's what people buy. They want to work with you because of your why. Ooh, that rhymes. I should make a poem out of that. Uh, so, so identifying the why, though, can be really quite tricky for a lot of people. So I'll give you a couple of tips or hints for how you can identify your why. Perfect. Um, I per personally think that most p entrepreneurs, especially service professionals, who are doing something where they're selling their expertise, their knowledge, their services, their gifts, so whether it's a healing practitioner or a consultant or um, engineers or, or uh, people like us who, who support people with education, uh, most of us get into business that we're in because we're trying to solve a problem. A problem that came up in most cases when we were very young. So I encourage entrepreneurs to look back to when they were young, sometime between four and six, maybe seven, eight, but typically in that age range, where there was something that was traumatic or might just have been a problem or something that motivated them to want to fix that um, in some way within themselves or within the world. So often I'll just ask them, if you had a magic wand, what's one thing you would change about the world, other people, or yourself? That one thing gives you a clue as to where the thing is that you see that is your note in the choir that gives you a clue. It's the end of the thread to your why, why you do what you do. So one thing is to take a look at what is it from the past that is a, a theme or a pattern or a... Um, a problem or a pain that you want to solve or heal, that gives you a clue into your why. Or what is your soapbox? What's the thing if you could wave a magic wand, you would save it or, or change it? Or what's the thing you get up on your soapbox off on the boat? If you don't know, ask your friends and they'll tell you because they're tired of hearing you talk about it. Um, <laughs> and that's probably connected to your why. Or if you look through your life and see a theme, um, a reoccurring story, something that you keep having to kind of redo over and over and over, either in relationships or in your business or something. That's part of what you're here to learn about and teach because I'm almost always, in my experience, what we are teaching is what we're here to learn. So um, it, all of those kind of give you a clue or an end of the thread to follow back to your why. And that's, you know, it may seem strange to say that I support women in, in growing into collaboration and expansion and co-creation because I had a mother who was destitute after five marriages and couldn't and died penniless and kind of without um, despairing of ever having significance. That's part of what drives me and motivates me to not want to be my mom and to not want other women to be in that situation where they haven't expressed who they are. They don't have the financial stability and they don't have the collaboration and communicate community to be safe, to be who they want to be and to be supported and encouraged in that. So my mom's challenges drive me to want to change that and create that in the world. So look to your past to find your future. Right. And I love that. And how does that, you know, move into the, you know, have being more mission versus purpose, you know, because a lot of people talk about, you know, what's your purpose? And so what's the distinction between, you know, being leading with your mission versus purpose? Well, and I think a lot of people transpose those words and they think they mean the same thing. But I actually think there's a distinction that's important, especially in terms of your business model. So mission driven people are people who are um, motivated by a cause. They have a mission. They have something outside of themselves that they want to create. Mission driven people need to create movements. They, it's important that they create tribes. It's important that they enroll people in that mission, in their vision for what they want to change in the world, whatever their portion of the world is. Mission driven people are more motivated by that cause and that external um, sense of, 
of shift or change that they're enacting than by, for instance, money or accomplishing specific targets and goals. It's much more about that lofty vision. Um, and the lofty vision can be, you know, neighborhood focused or it can be community focused. It can be global. It doesn't have to be lofty. doesn't necessarily mean big. It just means that vision of something that's outside of them. So that's mission driven uh, people. Purpose driven people are people who have an objective, a goal, a specific thing that they want to accomplish. And while they can sound similar, purpose driven people tend not to be as much about a movement and they are more about creating a functional vehicle that will accomplish that purpose. Now, in many cases, that's just a company or a team. They can even accomplish it on their own. Purpose-driven people could be a speaker with a book that's getting the message out. They're not about creating a cause, and necessarily a tribe. They might, but they might not. Um, and so what it really speaks to is, but it's important for them to accomplish their purpose, whatever that purpose may be. Um, and they tend to be more goal driven. It is more about the money and the vehicle that gets them to where they want to go. It's much more about objectives and outcomes and less about the people and the journey and the process. Um, it, these are not mutually exclusive, but right. um, mission driven people think movement, purpose driven people think vehicle like a company or um some kind of vehicle that's going to get them to that purpose quicker, easier. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it really speaks to business model. Um, Mission-driven people tend to need bigger teams. They tend to need the, the foundation and the infrastructure to create a movement. That takes more in many cases than a purpose-driven entrepreneur needs um, in terms of infrastructure. What often happens is they get transposed and purpose driven people think that they need to be able to be a tribe and they need to have a movement and they need all this infrastructure and so forth. And they often don't. Um, mission driven people are very um, benefited by pulling in purpose driven team mates and, and subcontractors or employees or even partners to get the stuff done because mission driven people are often the big picture people who like to take care of the vision. Right. not always great on the implementation. Right, right. So it can seem more like the, uh, the purpose, as it seems like more single focused, right? A little bit more narrow view, whereas mission's more expansive. Like it's like, you know, involves a lot more people, a lot more things going on, but there is a collaborative relationship that can happen you know, from the visionary to the implementers of how they can kind of work together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and both, both can have vision and both can be implementers and so forth. But mission is much more about a movement and purpose is much more about an objective uh, uh, an objective. And so, yeah, absolutely. Like you said, they can work well together and complement each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the different flavor, it helps us to know that so that we know how to enroll people, you know, purpose driven people tend to be much more, um, directional, in other words, delegate. Um, Mission-driven people need to enroll people in the vision and have collaborators within that, um, etc. So there's a different uh, focus and approach. Got it. Well, I would also love for you to talk a little bit about BQ and how how we need to increase that. Well, so my my company is called Bodacity, or my website is Bodacity.ca, and and part of this it came to me, Diane, in a. Oh, in a vision or a download about eight, nine years ago um, about Bodacity and this whole mission. Um, and I kept hanging up on the universe because I was in complete resistance to it. It's like, initially, it's like, I don't even like women. Go away. And, and then it was like, knock, knock, knock. Yeah, exactly. And then they were doing it again, and the universe would say, okay, this is your thing to do. And I was like, I'm not a feminist. You got the wrong number. Go away. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm a feminist, but I don't really want to do this. Go away. And then it was, oh, it's been done. And, oh, there's so many groups that deal with women entrepreneurs. And on and on. And this went on for like seven, eight years. And it still kept coming in and coming in and coming in. And finally, I ever so graciously surrendered and went, well, fine, fuck, I'll do it. That was my version of gracious surrender. Um, <laughs> about as gracious as that gets. So, so I finally, when I did surrender, kind of went, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I understand why me, why this, why now. I'm really starting to, at a much deeper level, appreciate why Gandhi said, uh, you know, the world will be saved by Western women. I don't actually think it's Western women. I think it's all women. But 
Western women have a louder voice. And so I think we will lead the conversation um, or we'll be heard first. I don't know that we're leading the conversation, but we're going to be heard first um, in a conversation that's going on globally for women to step up and really start to create change. And to do that, we need to be bolder. So bodacity quotient, I think, is far more important than IQ, um, which is your intelligence quotient, or even your EQ or EI, which is your uh, emotional intelligence, uh, because EQ, which, by the way, is completely made up, but it's totally valid. The same <laughs> as IQ and EQ, those are totally made up, too. Uh, your BQ is your your woohoo factor, your ability to take action no matter what, and it's your ability to step into the void. Without a high BQ, a bodacity quotient, women and men uh, aren't able to actually take action to get in the game and to act in spite of fear, not without fear but in spite of, right. because courage is not an absence of fear. It's the willingness to take a step, even if we're scared. And that comes from your BQ, your bodacity quotient, your ability to be bold and audacious, which is where the word bodacity came from, which I didn't make up, by the way. It's actually a real word. Um, and, and it is that ability to actually be um, brave, even when we don't feel like it so to have the courage and and part of the way to develop your bq is little leaps to take leaps with uh smaller bite-sized you know risks or challenges or things that take a little less courage and you're willing to do that builds up that muscle just like if you were going to go to the gym and build up a muscle um, and one of the other ways that you kind of mentioned was collaboration it's so much easier to leap when someone's holding our heart in our hand when they are ready to leap with us. And I think that there is, I know that there is, a rise of what I'm going to call sisterhood uh, around the world where um, people in general it's, uh, are really, it, at this particular point in time, very polarizing. Um, there's a large faction of us versus them, and I, I believe even larger faction of people who understand that it must be us and them together, that we have to collaborate. And especially in business, I really think, and again, especially women, but this applies to men and women, that if we don't actually leverage ourselves through collaboration, co-creation, getting really creative about how we do our businesses, um, that we cannot use that BQ to really be as effective as we could be. Mm -hmm. Too many women working too hard in isolation, entrepreneurs in general, you know, staring at their screens at 11 o'clock at night or 1 a.m. in the morning after everything else has been done, trying to get, muster up the energy to build this tribe that we support when we don't have a tribe that supports us. That doesn't work, and that's part of why so many women really struggle, get ill, and so many entrepreneurs end up burning out and leaving their businesses is because we don't have enough support. So part of BQ is really having the willingness to take the leap, and a big leap for a lot of people is creating the support that they want to need uh, and don't even know that they need to be able to play the bigger game. Right. So does that come into play with like why entrepreneurs fail? Absolutely. I think, um, well, and, and statistics bear out that women entrepreneurs tend to be more successful than men, but we build smaller businesses and make less money overall. And, and most entrepreneurs, um, you know, you, you've probably heard all the statistics that there's, you know, less than, well, depends on where you're looking at globally or, or North America, but less than, than 5 or 10% of people who start a business are still in business five years later. That means there's a whole whack of people, 80 to 95%, whose dreams are being put on the shelf, whose gifts are not being shared in as dynamic a way as they could be because they haven't created a big enough support network. And here's here's... You know, the, a lot of women like to say, oh, I'm a really good supporter. Um, BS, if you are a good supporter, you're also really good at receiving support because that's a way to support others is to let them give. Mm -hmm. And most women suck at that. And so it's, it's about, you know, if you ever walk past a construction zone where they're building a really big high rise, when they're building a really big building, 
there's a huge foundation. There's a huge hole in the ground and a deep, deep, deep foundation that that building gets built on. So if people want to grow their business, they need a bigger foundation. And in order to do that, that foundation for them is more support. Whether that's, you know, having someone take care of cleaning your house so they have more time to do your work without being exhausted or bringing in team members or having joint venture partners or creating project-based collaboration with people to market your, your business or do events. There's a billion different ways to create support. But unless and until we create more support, a bigger foundation, we cannot build a bigger building. We can, but it'll topple over. It's not sustainable. Right. So how does that uh, fold into the role that, that women need to play going forward? Oh, that's a big question. So I, uh, there's, there's so many components to that, Diane. And I think you do this beautifully in terms of what you do with your show, what you do with your speaking, and the stand that you are for women to seek power always and in all ways. Um, it's about really coming home to our power and our pleasure. And the reason I think it's our pleasure is so important is because I believe on the path of our pleasure is our purpose, that we really find out who we are and where our contribution lies when it brings us joy. And I believe there's a lot of really unhappy women, unhappy women who are pissed off, angry, tired. Um, and that means that if mom ain't happy, neither are the men, neither are the kids, neither is our planet. Mm -hmm. So really I think, you know, my, the, Bodacity's mission statement is shifting the world from fear to love one happy woman at a time. And I, and I every day see more and more, because when I first wrote that, I was like, really? That's what it's supposed to be? Okay. Because again, it was this download that I was in total resistance to. But more and more I understand the happier we are, and I mean sincerely happy, not being driven by shoulds and have tos, on the path of our pleasure, giving ourselves time and room to breathe, pulling in more support and receiving it, letting it be there and be effective for us. The more we do that, the more we get grounded, home centered, and the more powerful we can be. And then the more powerful we are, the more we can step up and truly partner with men. Cause I think there's been a whole bunch of them doing a bunch of stuff and us doing a bunch of stuff. And uh, a lot of that us versus them mentality going on, especially lately, um, I think it's time for true partnership. And, and I've really been spending a lot of time thinking about investigating the concept of equity versus equality. You know, I'm not sure that equality is what we would actually want um, because every single person is different, unique. Every situation is different and unique. No two people are the same. So we're not equal, but equity, that's fair. That's about fairness and, and treating one another the way we want to be treated, creating equity within and between us. So whether that's pay equity, whether which we still have a long ways to go, still white women make 72 cents on the dollar for, for every dollar that man in, men earn, down to 52 cents for Latina women on every dollar that men earn. So we have a long ways to go to create equity and fairness in the world. But I believe that when we come together then, and collaborate, then we can create equity in our businesses and equity in the world, which right. is really what I think is the role of women going forward, to create more of that fairness, more of that balance, and more connection. Because that's what we're very good at when we're on our game. Right. And it's so important to, to have that collaboration. And like you said, you know, reaching out for help. I mean, so many times as an entrepreneur, like you said, you know, we're in a room by ourselves, and it's like, who, who are you going to call kind of yeah. thing? And, you know, either coming from a place of not wanting to bother someone or, you know, they're busy, you know, getting back into that busy word and, you know, all of those things around that. But, you know, really to expand beyond what it is that we're here to do, we really do need to stand in our power and be able to look at that. And so I think that's actually another, you know, great part of the, the conversation here is what, what is some of the times that you have, you know, stood in your power and then when are some times that you've just given your power away? So mm -hmm. let's just start with like, when has been a time that you've felt disempowered? Oh, many. Um, <laughs> many, many. So there's been numerous times where I have 
you know, set up relationships or situations where I've given my power away, whether it's to partners or, or bosses. I think probably one of the more dramatic ones in my life was working with an organization, a large company. Uh, it was one of the few times I was in the doing, I call it doing time in the corporate trenches, uh, <laughs> Uh, which tells you just how much of an entrepreneur I am. Uh, so I, I had sold the biggest deal in the company's history, had been really filling in two roles, two VP roles, one for the East Coast, one for the West Coast, and working literally 17, 18 to sometimes 20 hours a day, every day, seven days a week, for about four months, exhausted, overwhelmed, burnt out, and had created this amazing result. This company had a history of firing people they owed money to. I knew that. I didn't cover my assets. And so I ended up being fired they owed, because they owed me $120,000. Uh, actually, more than that with expenses. So it uh, put me into a two-year period of depression, uh, ultimately a bankruptcy, which led to more depression because that was so against my values. Uh, and... And a real struggle to come back and find my energy, find who I was, dig myself back out. Like I, I immediately went back into trying to be an entrepreneur because it's what I knew. But when your cup's empty, there's nothing, there's no resources, there's nothing to do. So I survived for a couple of years until I started to come back into who I was, remember what, what I was up to and who I was and, and my why and kind of climb back out the other side. But it was a very low period um, with tons of anger and righteous indignation and so forth. I can tell the accountable version of that story, and it's a much different story of knowing full well what the company was like, not taking care of things, not putting in things in a timely fashion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the learning was, of course, to 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 take care of who I am and to take care of myself more and to not give my power away, to not abdicate responsibility um, and just hope that uh, people who I know to be one way will suddenly behave the other way. So it was a, it was devastating and highly educational and certainly was convicting for me that I think I'm down with corporations. Uh, so, so I haven't, haven't worked in a corporation since then. That was 2001. But um, uh, it was probably the time that I was the least home, the least right. in my body, least present in, in who I was and who I wanted to be in the world and the furthest away from any sense of my value, my contribution. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that because this is so important for the listeners to hear because, you know, we hear all the success stories, but we don't always hear like, hey, what were some of the things that took us out, right? And yeah. how do we work our way back to that? And, you know, as an entrepreneur, we can fall down quite a bit and to really know that we're in a long game here mm -hmm. and to know that, hey, there, there is a getting back up, there is finding yourself and really looking at the learning that happens in that, right? And so we now have, you know, eyes to see when things are coming, like how we're going to react to them and just adding that into our arsenal of, of what we're really looking at. So you have also, uh, give us an example of something that actually you stood in your power and you felt really empowered. Cool. Um, and and by the, before I do that, I really want to say I love and appreciate that you ask those questions because yeah, there's way too much, not only in our in education industry, but uh, our information industry, but in the world in general, too much of the polish and glitz and so forth and the, and the stories and the masks and not enough of the, yeah, no, sometimes it really sucks. <laughs> and sometimes we have to dig our way out of the crap back into the, the light. Um, so I'm really um, grateful to you for, for putting that balance perspective in the world um, and being a stand for people to really understand that they're not alone in that. Mm -hmm. um, so a time when I was really empowered. Well, when I feel the most empowered is when I get to use all of my gifts and talents and bring those to, to bear together. So usually that's facilitating personal development workshops or working with people on their business model and really supporting them in, in seeing what's going to work for them because there's, um, you know, there's a lot of 
information out there about entrepreneurship, a lot of information out there about uh, what you should be doing. And the reality is almost all of it is written by people who come from corporate and think that they'll just scale it down. But that's not true. Entrepreneurs are very different and they don't do things that don't think of things the way that people from corporate do or from, from you know, academia or government, etc. cetera. Um, they have a different brain. And so they don't do things that way. So when I get to work with entrepreneurs on how they actually work and what will actually make a difference and what's going to move the needle on their business, that's juicy for me. So there have been times where I've worked with clients or done workshops and I know there's this moment where intuition and skill and background and compassion and all of who I am, all of my ability and being comes to bear on that moment to just do something, say something, bring something in, try something. And almost always it's to try something that, you know, is a risk or that is um, coming from something other than my, um, you know, no, I know this will work. Uh, and, and there's a shift or an opening or an aha for someone where they get to really experience who they are and the difference they make and how they matter. That's what really touches my heart. That's when I feel the most powerful, when I feel like the most useful and that my contribution makes a big difference. That's it's those moments. It's not ever, you know, been on big stages, been on various different kinds of things where it, you know, sold big deals, etc. But it's the moments where people, you know, peer up or have a moment where there's a, a shift, a healing that is like, oh, okay, now we're talking. That's, <laughs> that's when I feel powerful. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. You know, and those are part of the, the relationships that we build, right? Then you know, the connection of the people that we get to work with and what our bigger work and, and stepping into our why and what that looks like. And so, you know, speaking of why, one of the things I always like to look at is how our environment impacts us. And I know you have a, you know, laptop lifestyle and you're on the road <laughs> quite a bit. Yeah. Um, one of the things we look at is in your, in your personal space, like when you are at home, you know, we have a different experience, whether we're in our bedroom or our kitchen or our office. What's your favorite room in your home and why? Oh, interesting question. Well, and, and it's kind of funny because one of the challenges I do have is I don't have as much control over my environment as I would like. So for example, right now, I'm staying at a friend's house. This is not a backdrop that I would normally pick for something like this, but it's what I've got to work with. Uh, the laptop lifestyle requires me to be very flexible about environments. So one of the things that I have really come to understand, you know that saying that home is where the heart is? Mm -hmm. I've shifted it. Heart is where my home is. And so my favorite room is actually my heart. <laughs> so my favorite room is actually... I love that. <laughs> um, because that's wherever I go, what I do is I attend to connecting with people. So if I'm in a new city or a new town or something like that, like I lived in Mexico for five months um, last winter in Panama the year before, um, I plug into the community as soon as possible because that's where my home is, is in the relationships. Or I really attend to connecting with people back home. Now, all that said, I would have to say my favorite room is probably my bedroom because, so in the place that I have here that is my base of operations, um, is my bedroom because it's that little sanctuary space where I can decorate it the way I want. And it's got lots of bright, vibrant colors, but it's also very restful. I can have candles uh, and music and I can tell, ask my Google home mini to tell me jokes, uh, which I do frequently um, or play games with me. So it is, it's my little sanctuary and it is uh, when I'm there, it is the room that is the most uh, me. Uh, of all of the places that I have um, and typically where wherever I am I will take something like a scarf and put it over a lamp to create something some color in whatever space that I'm in uh, simply because I love color and I love some vibrancy but I also like uh, that restfulness so so when I travel I take a couple of scarves and I'll decorate a hotel room with them just so that I have a little piece of home but for me, heart is where the home is instead of home is where the heart is. Uh, and that really attending to that, especially for mobile lifestyle people, is really significant because otherwise we get disconnected and it gets very hard mm. to be a hard lifestyle. 
That is so beautiful. I love that. And I actually do the same thing. I just came back from a hotel yesterday and I bring scarves. I like to cover like electronics, you know, because that also creates a very, you know, sanctuary uh, environment there. And I think there's such little touches you can do to really shift and change your environment and, and what that looks like. So mm-hmm. that is just amazing and beautiful. And uh, so Jenna, you and I could be talking all afternoon here and, and uh, <laughs> so appreciate it time. Um, I'd love to know, I know you have a free gift for our audience and please also share how they can stay in contact with you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things. One is that I have a, uh, a little ebook with an assessment tool in it because I know a lot of entrepreneurs are wanting to grow their business. And so one of the things is there's a lot of ways to grow a business, but there's not a lot of ways that are going to be right for you for your style, for who you are as an introvert or an extrovert, who you are in terms of the kind of way you want to interact with people. So this uh, is called Your Key to Freedom, Leverage, Leveraging Strategies, Which One is Best for You? And it's a little assessment tool that you can take this little quiz and figure out which one is best going to suit you in terms of ways to scale your business. To go from a one-to-one business model to a one-to-many business model. Is it group coaching? Is it teaching? Is it workshops? Is it you know online seminars? Is it etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a whole bunch of different ways to scale and to a one-to-many model or yeah one-to-many and this is a great little assessment tool for you to figure out what's your style your approach that's going to work for you so they can go to www.bodacity.ca for canada backslash leverage l-e-v you know how to spell leverage <laughs> no, and we'll have it in this sh- we'll have it in the okay. show notes as well yeah. so for those who are driving so they don't crash you know they yes can, exactly they can look and in the show notes the other thing that I want to offer, but I really want to make this offer only to people who are really sincere about figuring out your positioning um, and, and exactly who you want to be in terms of the difference you want to make in the world. And the reason I say that is because there's lots of people who struggle with their marketing or who have been spinning for a long time. If you've been spinning for a long time, don't call because um, there's a reason why you're spinning. There's a, there's a not ready yet. The fear is too big. There's a reason why you're spinning. So trust that. Allow that to be for the time being. If, however, people are ready to actually kind of grow to that next stage and figure out what their why is, uh, whether it's the why they do what they do, why I should buy you, or why do I need what you have, then I'm offering a complimentary uh, why session, uh, what's your why session that they can book on my calendar, which the link will be down below because the link's too long. Um, and, and it's a half hour complimentary session. It's not just a sales pitch. We actually do work on what your why is, uh, and help you really dial that in so you can get your positioning, uh, clearer and have a good answer when people say, what do you do, uh, in a way that gets them to lean in and is more compelling. So that's, uh, you know, I only can fit in three to four of those a week. So book now and I will get to you as soon as I can. Oh, All right. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I've done one of these sessions with, with Jeanette and she has such a powerful insight of really looking as like what's below in, in your why, in your why conversation. Uh, so definitely take uh, people up on that. So I just want to thank the audience for your time, for being here, and I'd love for you to you know, share this uh, with your community, to subscribe, to put into the comments. What did you take away from here? What is your why? I'd love to hear what your why is in, in the comments, and please you know, uh, tag both myself and Jeanette. Uh, we'll also have in the show notes uh, my free gift, which is the liferesetquiz.com. So all of these things will be in the notes to be able to follow us, and until we connect again, live your spot life.